Hi, my name is Dr. Jeremiah Johnson. I'm an associate professor of neurosurgery here at UCLA and UCLA Health. Welcome to the Clinical Advancement Series. Today we're going to talk about chronic subdural hematomas and specifically a very unique type of new procedure that may be able to treat chronic subdural hematomas um, in a, an effective, minimally invasive way. So I want to welcome my colleague and partner, Dr. Jeff Colby here. I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce himself and uh, go through an overview of this pathology and this new treatment. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Colby. I'm an associate professor of neurosurgery and radiology here at UCLA. I'm also the director of cerebrovascular neurosurgery and the residency program director, so very involved in, in education. Um, and as Dr. Johnson said, we're here today to talk about a a new treatment or a relatively new treatment that we've been using to, uh, to effectively um, facilitate the treatment of a growing problem, and that is chronic subdural hematomas, which is primarily a, a condition of the elderly. So chronic subdural hematomas uh, is a very common uh, clinical condition that we see here in neurosurgery. And a chronic subdural hematoma is basically a collection of blood products in the space between the surface of the brain and the inner linings of the skull called the dura mater. Here is a CT scan where we see a collection of chronic blood, and this represents a chronic subdural hematoma. This corresponds to the area that we see here in red, which is blood in between the dura mater, which is the thick covering of the brain, and the arachnoid matter, which is a covering on top of the brain. And this is a growing problem, and it's a significant problem in older people. The chance of having a chronic subdural hematoma increases by threefold in people over 80 years old. The reasons for increase can be age related brain atrophy, it can be a risk for falls, and the use of blood thinners such as anticoagulants or antiplatelet medications. And by 2030, chronic subdural hematomas are thought to be one of the most common clinical conditions that neurosurgeons will be treating, one of, the uh, one of the most common cranial surgeries that we will be doing. So it's a big growing problem. These subdural hematomas can be unilateral, meaning on one side of the brain, as is shown here, or they can be bilateral on both sides of the brain, as is shown over here. Here's one side, and then here's the other. And they, when they grow large, cause pressure or compression of the brain. This is an example of an image, what's called a coronal image on an MRI, showing subdural hematoma on one side, subdural hematoma on the other, and how they depress the brain and compress the brain, resulting in the vasculature of the brain being pushed down, as seen on these angiography images on the right and left. And this pressure causes problems. And what happens is that patients can have a variety of symptoms, including headaches, nausea and vomiting, confusion, seizures, weakness on one side of the body, and even imbalance. And these symptoms can come on relatively quickly, or they can come on slowly over time. The source of bleeding. Um, these subdural hematomas can happen after minor trauma. That can be a source of bleeding, sometimes after major trauma, but it can happen, uh, I'd say, reasonably uh, frequently after minor um, unsuspecting trauma. And it was originally thought that the blood vessels that bridge through the dura and up to sort of the top region of the head, called these bridging veins, were thought to be the source of bleeding for these subdural hematomas. But more modern theories re uh, revolve around disruption of a cell layer called the dural border cell layer as the, uh, as the culprit for the source of these hematomas. In this image over here, we see a patient that has a subdural hematoma on the left side of the brain. It's the right side of the picture, but the left side of the brain. And this is pushing the vasculature down towards the brain. And on the right side of the brain, there is no subdural hematoma, but there is brain atrophy, which is a risk factor for development of these hematomas. These hematomas expand over time, and that's how they cause problems. Um, over time, the body creates a layer of tissue and a new blood vessels called neomembranes around the hematoma, and this is part of the problem. The membranes can be leaky and result in new bleeds into the same area, and the membranes bleed more than they absorb, so there's more bleeding 
uh, that's filling up the space and making the space bigger than the body can deal with or take away, then the hematomas will expand over time and cause symptoms and likely neurological problems. This is an example of a, a CT scan or a CAT scan showing bilateral hematomas. These are what we call subacute on chronic hematomas, meaning there's newer blood as well as older blood. And this is what this type of uh, patient looks like in the operating room. We have the bone of the skull here with the white arrow. We have the dura mater shown with the blue arrow. And then we have a subdural membrane shown with the black arrow. And these membranes are the source of new bleeding and new problems. Now there's a vicious cycle that goes along with this, uh, with the development and the enlargement of these membranes. We start off with some sort of inciting event where we have traumatic head injury, uh, and it doesn't even, there doesn't even have to be trauma associated with this, but commonly it happens after trauma, which disrupts this dural border cell layer. This leads to inflammatory cells that are drawn to the border cell layer in an attempt to actually repair the injury. Um, these membranes form, and there's inf inflammation and procollagens that, that uh, occur. There are angiogenic factors, so the inflammation and the development of the membranes, these membranes then want to grow new blood vessels to feed the new tissue that develops. And then the, the new blood vessels, which are fragile and leaky, will leak blood, or there will be exudate or fluid accumulation into the hematoma, and this causes even more problems from membranes that then cycles back. So you have membranes and new blood vessels that leak and have new bleeding. The new bleeding causes more inflammation and more membranes and more leaky blood vessels, and then it just snowballs uh, out of control into a growing hematoma. And the body does not have a good way to deal with this. Now the classic treatments of chronic subdural hematomas uh, have been surgical, um, or largely surgical, I should say. And there's a variety of different surgical treatments. Um, a common surgical treatment is something called burr holes, where we make two small holes in the bone, each about the size of a quarter. We gain access to the dura mater, which is seen in the center of the holes, and then we poke through that and drain the hematoma, or the fluid that has accumulated. Uh, burr holes is, I'd say, probably the most commonly used surgical treatment for subdural hematomas. We can also make a larger window in the bone called a craniotomy. Um, craniotomy oftentimes is made by uh, uh, connecting these holes and just making a larger window that gives us better access to the membranes and a little bit more ability to flush out the hematoma. Um, there's different port systems, such as something called the SEP system, which is basically this device shown here at the bottom of the screen, which is a suction bulb uh, hooked up to a, uh, uh, that we hook up to the subdural space to help drain the blood. Um, there's variations on the types of surgery. Some people have used endoscopes to help visualize the surgical space a little bit better. And also we, we can leave drains behind in the, in the subdural space to help drain fluid or reaccumulation of blood that happens even after the surgery procedure. This is an example of a craniotomy, a, a larger hole in the bone, a bigger window. I'd shown you this picture before. And then the use of an endoscope to visualize the hematoma and visualize the um, evacuation of the hematoma. But surgery has possible complications, um, as, as we all know, I think. And some of those complications can be pneumocephalus, or accumulation of air inside the head. Uh, this is an example, this, this black area here and here. This is pneumocephalus, which can create alterations in mental status, and sometimes seizures, and prolonged hospitalization. Um, patients even without pneumocephalus after surgery for subdural hematomas can have a seizure. Uh, there can be infection. We can misplace potentially a drain that we put in. And then there's the big concern of uh, re-bleeding or reaccumulation of the hematoma. A patient with a chronic subdural hematoma is at risk for new bleeding really at any point. Uh, it could be immediately after surgery, several days after surgery, or even weeks or months down the road. And that's because of the presence of these membranes. Jeff, could I ask you a quick question about that? Absolutely. So when they have these re-bleeding, why, 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 why is that something that happens? Um, well, so the, the thought is that because the presence of these membranes, which really surround the whole hematoma and oftentimes uh, will develop over an entire side of the head or an entire hemisphere, all of these membranes cannot be accessed through surgery. We can't go in surgically and remove every single membrane that's formed. And the presence or the persistence of those membranes over time is what causes the bleeding risk. 
So what you're essentially saying is the membranes are kind of the cause of this leaking effect and they don't stop just because you drain the blood in some cases. Yes, that, that's, the, that's the theory that we have at this moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to possible alternate therapies. Um, and there is something called embolization or middle meningeal artery embolization. And MMA is, is, a, is a short way of saying middle meningeal artery, middle meningeal artery which is a tongue twister as you just <laughs> saw. Um, this procedure was first done in the mid-1990s. Um, it's the evidence behind it is growing, and Dr. Johnson will be talking about that in a little bit. Um, and it's been used as a in a variety of situations. It's been used as an initial treatment for a chronic subdural hematoma. It's been used as an adjunct treatment prior to or immediately after surgery. Um, and it's been used for hematoma recurrence, meaning somebody who's had surgery and then has a recurrence later on. Uh, is often, uh, that patient is oftentimes a candidate for MMA embolization. And the middle meningeal artery is a, a blood vessel that neurosurgeon and, neurosurgeons encounter all the time during open surgery. It's a blood vessel that runs um, in the dura or the thick coverings of the brain. This is that vessel here. It has a variety of different characteristic branches that go along with it. Um, if we looked on the inner surface of the skull, we all have these indentations in the skull, which are where that blood vessel is located. So it's underneath the bone of the skull, it's in the thick coverings of the brain called the dura, but it is outside of the brain itself. Um, and the goal of MMA embolization is to block the blood supply to these abnormal leaky blood vessels. That is thought to be how this procedure works. We go in, we block this artery, which is feeding these membranes and feeding these leaky blood vessels, and thereby we, we help shut down the mechanisms that are causing hematoma formation and hematoma recurrence. Uh, there's a variety of different agents that we use to do these embolizations to block these blood vessels and these membranes. Uh, these are examples of them here on the screen. We have uh, little spheres or particles. We have glue-like agents uh, such as crazy glue for the brain or crazy glue for the blood vessels, I should say. Uh, we have other uh, liquid embolic agents called onyx. And then we have microcoils or little platinum wires that can be placed in different portions of the blood vessel to help block it. Um, so Dr. Johnson, if you could talk about the data behind MMA embolization and maybe provide a couple of cases, that would be great. Thank you, Jeff. So we're gonna review some of the literature supporting why we do middle meningeal artery embolizations. So this is a graph showing the number of publications in the literature. These are doctors talking to each other about evidence supporting or refuting a particular procedure. Since 1995 through 2022, you see this rapid increase in the past 10 years or so, culminating in the past few years of interest in publishing about middle meningeal artery embolization. In addition, there's clinical trials currently being performed, and 19 that we know of around the country at the time of this recording. Uh, 16 of those are randomized clinical trials, which are more rigorous investigations of whether this works over standard treatment and in what ways. And you can see just a listing on this table of the various clinical trials from around the world, really, and the types of agents they're using. And we look forward to the results of these trials, but none of them have been published as of yet. However, we do have some published literature about how this works in addition to our personal experiences. And this is a busy slide, but I, it summarizes the literature we have thus far. And I want to emphasize here um, the types of trials that they are the number of cases that they have, and then the, these boxes around some of the more critical outcome information. So for example, successful embolization rate, how often these are successfully performed procedures. In these trials, it seems to range from 88% to around 100%. And this is the kind of the proof of, of what we're trying to look for, which is how often do these patients, when they have middle meningeal artery embolization, need salvage surgeries? particularly patients that have embolization before they have surgery, how often they later need surgery. And you see the rates of this are quite low. So some of the larger studies, for example, have a salvage rate of needing drainage of the, of the hematoma, 65.5%, all the way up to 11%. But most of these numbers range four to zero to 4.5 to 8.9. So something in that range of eventually needing surgery. Um, and you can remember that about 10 to 30% of patients that have surgery end up needing more surgery. So this seems to be pretty favorable compared to regular drainage surgery. Also, we wanna know how dangerous is this to perform? 
Uh, we talked about some of the complications that can happen from drainage surgery. What about metameningeal artery embolization? So in these, in these studies, you see somewhere between zero and as high as about 6.5% uh, complication rate um, from these procedures. And this can be just related to the angiogram itself. The procedures are performed from inside the blood vessel, so bleeding from the puncture site all the way up to um, other, other neurological complications. All right, so these are just kind of summations of, this, of the data that we have thus far, and uh, I won't get into too much of the study type details, but this is the summary here, which is that the odds ratio, which is a statistical measure of looking at the surgical patients versus the middle meningeal artery embolization patients in the literature, and it seems to these seem to favor um, immobilization having less retreatment of the hematoma than even traditional surgery. Um, similarly, the a forest plot of complication rates of embolization versus conventional surgery also tends to favor embolization. So these are some of the statistics and the data that we have that make us very excited about this potential treatment modality for certain types of select middle, uh, chronic subdural hematomas. Next, we want to kind of in, illustrate what these middle meningeal artery embolization cases look like and what the procedures look like. Uh, so we'll have a few case examples. Here, this is a patient uh, that came into our hospital in their 70s. Their family noticed they were more confused than usual and came, brought them in for evaluation. A CT scan of the head here uh, with the axial on the left showing the brain sliced in that manner um, with the eye, eyes are here, the nasal sinus is here, ears are here in the sides and in the back of the head. And as this plays through, you can see a hematoma here with the edge of the brain being right there and the brain being pushed off to the contralateral side. This is easier to see on the coronal view where in this view the eyes are here and we're slicing from front to back. And as we see on this one, this is the hematoma here. This is the edge of the brain and this is the middle of the brain being pushed from one side to the other. That mass effect, we call it, that pressure of the brain being pushed from one side to the other is what causes these symptoms of confusion. The patient underwent conventional burr hole surgery where we drained the blood out, we left a drain. So this is the CT after surgery showing that the fluid collection is much smaller. This is, the blood has been replaced which with saline, just regular water in the operating room. And there's a drain here to drain out any of that residual bleeding and allow the brain to re-expand and get rid of this hematoma. This is the coronal view of the same thing. There's a, the little surgical drain here and here, and the fluid is much better. Um, it's much smaller, and the midline of the brain is coming much more closer to where it should be. Patient improved and was discharged from the hospital. Three weeks after surgery, we saw them back in clinic to see how they were doing, check on the incision with a new CT scan to see if that last little bit of the collection had resolved. Uh, however, unfortunately, this axial CT scan shows that the collection is actually enlarged slightly, and this brighter color fluid here indicates that there's been ongoing bleeding into that fluid space, which is similar to what Dr. Colby alluded to earlier, which is these membranes are leaking blood continuously, and the collection is enlarging rather than getting smaller. This is the coronal view of a similar thing with the enlargement of the, hem of the hematoma under the skull there, and you can even see the little hole we made in the skull during the first drainage there. So to try to prevent this from continuing to expand and avoid another surgery, we felt that middle meningeal artery embolization was a good option in this patient. So this is actually in the angiography suite where we've taken tubes and wires inside the blood vessel in a minimally invasive manner um, up to the middle meningeal artery, which is a branch off of the carotid artery that goes to the skin of the face um, and head, and then one of the branches off the external carotid artery is the middle meningeal artery, which is the one we're gonna embolize. So this is a front view, called an AP view, and here we are with our small microcatheter tube in the middle meningeal artery injecting contrast dye into that lining of the brain called the dura through the middle meningeal artery. And this is this, what we call the lateral view. And in this case, our tip of our microcatheter is here, and we're injecting dye up through the meningeal middle meningeal artery. And I just let that play. All right, so in this case, we injected particles through the tube, those little spheres that Jeff mentioned, and they travel with the blood flow and lodge up, up here into the subdural hematoma membranes. 
as you inject these particles, you eventually see that the blood flow is, turn, is becoming very slow in the vessel, and that's when you know you're done. And in this case, we put a little metal coil here to make sure that this was a durable occlusion, that the, the, the particles didn't break down and the blood flow returned. Uh, after the procedure was done, this is a lateral angiogram showing that we no longer see filling of the middle meningeal artery, which was used to be here. This is a separate artery high, higher up on the skin called the superficial temporal artery. All right, so the patient had that procedure, went home the next day, did well. And three weeks after, we checked in again on the patient's CT scan. And although it's not completely resolved, we see that it has slightly gotten smaller and does not look like there's as fresh a bleeding over the majority of it like there was before. Fast forward to three months after the procedure, and you can see that this is really almost completely resolved here on both the axial and coronal views, illustrating the point that sometimes these membranes are the pathological problems and that until you address the leakiness of these membranes, uh, these can tend to come back on recurrently. All right, we're gonna switch over to Jeff to talk about some of the studies we've done on metameningeal artery embolization here at UCLA Health. So thank you, Jeremiah. That was a, a great case example of, of how this embolization procedure works and how it can benefit patients. Um, you, did, uh, you did mention some of the data that we have, at least up until this moment, and the different trials that are ongoing to, to help hopefully prove that this technique is robust and works. Um, and we actually have looked at some of this here at UCLA ourselves um, in collaboration with our uh, neurointerventional radiology colleagues. Um, us in the Department of Neurosurgery um, collected some of our data on our MMA embolizations and tried to ask the question, how much embolization is needed in order to get the results that we want to get, which is shrinkage or resolution of the subdural hematoma. Um, there's no, or at least at the time, there were no studies out there saying how many branches we needed to block or how far we actually had to go with the embolization in order to try to get improvement in the patient's condition. Um, so that's what we looked at. And we had a, a couple of our fantastic neurosurgery residents work on this project in, in conjunction with some of our uh, medical students as well, and we're able to publish a nice paper, which is shown here. Uh, and this was in the, uh, the neurosurgical journal called Neurosurgery. And we found, uh, or I should say uh, before that, what we did is um, we looked at the different patients that we treated with MMA embolization over the course of uh, from 2017 to 2021. We did a chart review, looked at their medications, whether they were on anti- platelet or anticoagulants, and then we looked at their CAT scans to show um, what sort of results they got after an embolization and how fast their subdural hematomas went away. And we did volumetric analysis. Here's an example of, of a subdural hematoma being outlined, and we assessed those volumes over time uh, at different time points after an embolization. Um, and here's an example, um, again, a case example or some images from an embolization procedure. This is a patient actually with bilateral subdural hematomas, which you can see here on the uh, outer edges of the brain and underneath the skull. These are angiography images showing injection of contrast dye into the middle meningeal artery. This is a, a view from the front and a view from the side showing the contrast dye. This is an image during injection of an embolic material called NBCA, which we commonly refer to as glue showing that we were able to inject the NBCA into the middle meningeal artery and actually get good penetration into the dura in the middle of the head called the FALX, F-A-L-X. Um, and these are CAT scans uh, before and after showing bright white in this midline structure, which is the glue agent in the middle um, of the dura called the FALX. And this means we were able to get the embolic agent far out into the vessel and even into the midline, which shows that we were able to hopefully do a good job uh, targeting those membranes and surrounding the hematoma. And what we found um, was that if we, if we got the embolic agent far, meaning into the midline, we were actually able to speed up the resolution or the resorption of the hematoma, meaning the further we got the embolic agent, the faster the hematoma shrunk down in follow-up CAT scans. And this, this uh, signifies a, a, a great uh, target to strive for. And we termed this the bright fox sign. And this was because the, the embolic agent in the fox is bright white on a CT scan, and therefore we were able to see it after the procedure, and we labeled that the bright fox sign. 
this is an example, uh, another case example of a patient uh, in her 70s uh, who had uh, about a month of progressive cognitive decline, less interaction with her family, um, and frequent falls. And this patient was found to have a moderate sized chronic subdural hematoma um, on the right side of the brain. This is a, a different view showing that hematoma and some brain compression from it. And this is a video showing that hematoma as well. Uh, this patient was not a great surgical candidate. She was actually um, cachectic or, or you know, very thin and, and potentially um, of low nutritional status, meaning that she probably was not going to heal well from a surgical incision. Um, so we decided to try an M MMA embolization as an alternate therapy. Uh, and that's what was done. Uh, these are a couple snapshots from the procedure of the embolization. This is the uh, microcatheter injection showing the middle meningeal artery. We're looking from the front of the head. This is the injection of the glue agent. We we're able to get that glue not only on the side that we are injecting, but we can actually inject it across the middle of the head. Um, and we're able to get some penetration into the midline region here, even though it's not well seen on this picture. If we look at the CT scans after the procedure, we're able to see that bright white in the middle, which is also sh shown here on the video, uh, where there's some dots of bright white in the middle signifying that we're able to get that glue um, or that liquid embolic agent far into the vessel and into the middle uh, and surround this hematoma, which we see here on the still shot and we see here on the video. Um, and that is that bright Fox sign we were alluding to. Four months after the procedure, there's very little hematoma left. It's almost near complete resolution um, just after the embolization alone, meaning this patient did not require a surgical treatment. This patient just had the embolization and were able to get excellent, excellent results four months down the line. Here again, we can see no hematoma left or, or almost no hematoma left on that side. And that's a very good outcome. So just to summarize some of the things that we've been talking about, um, Chronic subdural hematoma is a complex disease process of increasing importance. And as our population in the United States and around the world for that matter ages, this is going to be more prevalent and, and more of a problem that we have to deal with. Um, patient selection is key. Whether a patient is selected for surgery uh, as the primary treatment, embolization as the primary treatment, or some combination thereof, it's all about patient selection, as, as with is the case in, in many um, uh, health scenarios. Uh, surgery remains an important part of what we do to treat subdural hematomas, particularly for those hematomas that are larger in size, have a lot of brain compression when the, first in, when the patient first presents to us. Um, surgery oftentimes is the way to do an initial treatment to get that immediate brain decompression. Um, but MMA embolization shows much promise as a treatment. Um, and as you saw in a previous slide, there, there are a ton of different randomized controlled trials ongoing, where hopefully we'll start getting data on those shortly to help guide us in our decision making. Uh, but, but all of the publications uh, in the literature right now point towards positive outcomes with this embolization procedure when it's used um, uh, at an appropriate time. And with that, we'd like to say thank you very much. Uh, this is our uh, cerebrovascular neurosurgery team. Um, you can see Dr. Dr. Johnson over here, this is myself in the middle, and our, our close colleague, Dr. Anthony Wong. Thank you, Jeff, for that great overview. I just want to bring up a couple of common questions that come up when we talk to these patients so that the audience will be able to kind of hear the, some of these answers as well. How do you think about which patients to do open surgical drainage versus middle meningeal artery embolization? And also, what is their expected time in the hospital? And how does that whole process look to you? Yeah, so uh, great question. And you know, as we talked about at the end of, of our presentation, it's, it's all about patient selection. And those patients that have larger hematomas with a lot of brain compression who have active neurological symptoms, those are people that typically need help right away to get rid of the hematoma. And those are patients that are, that are often good for surgical evacuation first. Um, patients that have a hematoma with maybe more mild symptoms, maybe just headaches or or just a little bit of mild neurological symptoms without a lot of brain compression, those patients have a little more time for the hematoma to resolve. And, and sometimes we think about doing an MMA embolization as a first option on those patients, particularly if those patients need to be on antiplatelet or, or anticoagulant medications for other problems, such as heart disease, which is a very common problem. 
Um, as far as time in the hospital, it's very different between the, the, the two different therapies. You know, patients that have a surgical evacu evacuation are oftentimes in the hospital for several days at a time. They have to you know, recover from the immediate effects of the anesthesia. Typically, they're uh, flat in bed for a day or so while we're waiting for the brain to help re-expand to fill that, that void where the hematoma was. Um, so it, I'd say on average, it's about two to three days in the hospital for a patient who has had surgery for an embolization procedure. Um, on the, on the, the flip side of that is the MMA embolization, given that it's not, doesn't require an incision and a true surgical, um, uh, a true surgical intervention, oftentimes those patients go home a lot faster. Um, most of the time we, we will monitor that patient overnight in the hospital, and if they're doing well, we can tend to get them home the next day, which is great for the patients. Yeah, that's my experience as well, which is that um, if you're a good candidate for an MMA embolization, one of the benefits is a much shorter course in the hospital. And I, I do want to emphasize that middle meningeal arteries embolization is like a really excellent new option for patients that really need to be on blood thinners. Uh, because as we mentioned in the talk, um, you can block off these leaky membranes and hopefully speed them to getting back onto the blood thinners, which traditionally after a brain surgery um, or in a patient with a hematoma like this, you cannot be on blood thinners for sometimes months. Um, so it's a really nice option to supplement in those patients. Right, and, and it's a great point. And sometimes we have these discussions with their other providers like their cardiologists, and sometimes we opt to do an embolization and then follow it by surgery, or surgery followed by an embolization to try to get them back on the blood thinners quicker, but it's an excellent point. Yeah, great. So Jeff, kind of, can you give us just a more practical overview of how this procedure is performed, the middle meningeal artery embolization? Sure, um, yeah, it's an excellent point. It's a common question that comes up for patients. Uh, the procedure is performed really through a, a needle stick in the body. Um, we are, as, as I believe you mentioned in the presentation, we're bringing basically catheters and wires inside the arteries of the body. And we can either enter the body through the wrist or through the top of one of the legs in either the radial artery in the wrist or the femoral artery in the leg. And we bring a, a system of catheters or, or basically a system of flexible tubes into the arteries of the body that go up to the neck and go up to the head region inside the blood vessels. So there is no classic surgical incision needed. And once the catheters are in position, we take some pictures by injecting contrast dye, and then we choose the vessels that we want to block or the branches of the MMA uh, artery that we want to block. And then we use these different embolic agents that we showed on the screen. So in your case, you, you used particles to block the vessel nicely. In my case, I used uh, NBCA or glue to block the vessels nicely. And then there's times when we use coils to block the vessels or onyx to block the vessels. It's really customized for the patient. Um, but but it's, a, it's a minimally invasive procedure. There's very little you know, classic wound healing that goes along with it. And how do you like to perform yours? Do you perform yours under general anesthesia or, or do you have your patients awake for the procedure? Yeah, so one of my kind of preferences, particularly in the older patient population, is that tr if possible, if the patient's cooperative, is try to do them without any general anesthesia. So not actually putting a breathing tube in and doing, you know, going to sleep like you would in the traditional operating room. Sometimes we need to do that to make sure the patient's still and we can perform, you know, not moving too much during the procedure and we can perform the procedure safely. But um, it, intrinsically, the, the procedure is not painful um, if you do it in certain ways. And so I think it's a real secondary benefit to doing embolization over a surgery in certain patients, which is that um, you don't even have to undergo full general anesthesia, just some light sedation that kind of make you sleepy, something like people may have experienced with a colonoscopy, that kind of sedation. Um, and it really helps the older folks in particular get up on their feet and, um, and, and kind of get back at it um, more quickly than having to go under general anesthesia sometimes or even going to the operating room and have a general anesthesia plus cranial brain surgery. Yeah, I think it's, it's great to have the flexibility or the option of, of doing the procedure with less sedation or more sedation depending on the, on the patient and what their needs are and, and, and sometimes what their wants are as right. well. And sometimes at, the end, sometimes at the end of the day, you leave the hospital the next day and you have to have a small little, little ditzel on either your wrist or your leg, and that's the only thing that you have um, left over from the procedure. Uh, so it's a nice option in some, in some slip cases, as you mentioned. Um, is this procedure painful? Uh, I would say by and large, no. Um, you know, if, if the patient is under light sedation, they do get some local anesthetic uh, at the location where the procedure is performed. Um, the movement of catheters through the body is, is really not felt by the patient. Um, and then the embolization itself, 
depending on which agents or which blocking you know, materials we use, some of them uh, are not felt at all and some of them are felt. And for the, for the times that we use agents that are, that are felt by the body, it's oftentimes better just to have those patients asleep so that they don't have to uh, undergo discomfort. I did the same. Um, you know, it sounds very scary. We're taking a tube up right near the brain and blocking off vessels. Is that dangerous to the brain at all? Are you at risk of having brain damage from the glue or, um, or you know, does, it, does the brain or the body need this lining? And when you block off the blood supply, is there something bad that happens? Right. So, yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, as, as I think everybody knows, doctors and patients who, who might be listening to this, um, all procedures we do obviously have risks and there's no such thing as a risk-free procedure in the hospital. And, and it's, it's important for you to have a discussion with, with your doctor about what those risks are. But by and large, we can do these procedures safely. Uh, we have very good technology to not just bring catheters inside the body, but to visualize those catheters inside the body. And it's really up to the specialist to have a, you know, a very good understanding of what can and can't be done when those catheters are inside and the anatomy of the middle meningeal artery and where we can do blockages and where we're, we can't because we might get into trouble. Uh, but you know, assuming, assuming the patient is with somebody who's good and knows what they're doing, uh, it should be a very safe procedure. And as far as blocking the blood vessels in the dura, there's really very little consequences to that. Um, you know, as, and, and you know, being a neurosurgeon just like I am, this is a vessel that we block all the time during open brain surgery with very little consequences. So the MMA embolization, we're really just doing the same, th same thing, but through a, a less invasive approach. And the dura uh, can handle that blockage. And as, as we've seen, that can have some distinct benefits. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I don't think that losing the dura or damaging the dura in any way has, has come up as a complication. And these vessels that we're in, in don't intrinsically go to the brain. They just go to the lining of the, of the underside of the skull Absolutely. called the dura. So that's an important thing to, to think about. How, do you, how long do you expect it to take for a middle meningeal artery embolization to you know, cure or resolve one of these hematomas? Yeah, so I, I think at least with the patients that we've treated here at UCLA, um, it varies. Um, some people will start seeing resolution or shrinkage of the hematoma with, within days to weeks, and some people it's more weeks to months. Uh, but overall, you know, as, as our paper had shown, and I think as the, uh, uh, the kind of conglomerate studies or these meta-analyses in the literature have shown, a good 60 to 80 percent of people will, will have benefit from this type of procedure. Yeah, my, exactly my experience as well, which is that it, you can, some people can see an effect as soon as a few weeks. Um, most commonly, you get these really nice results at about the three to four month mark. Um, and although sometimes there's still a little bit of the collection there, it seems to be the chances that you have to go back to surgery after an embolization is actually quite low. All right, well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today, especially my colleague, Dr. Jeff Colby, uh, for the UCLA Neurosurgery Clinical Advances series, and hope that we see you next time. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Jeff.